Wherefore, gird up the loins of your minds. Be sober. And hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. They were expecting Christ to come back in their lifetime. And then in verse 14, he says this. As obedient children. Now, as we get into verse 14 and break it down for the next few moments, let us remind ourselves again of Peter's posture. Peter now has been changed. He has won a lot of those battles. He has conquered a lot of those things. Much of what he is writing about now, he's looking back before the day of Pentecost. We talk about it on Wednesday nights. We refer to it all the time in Sunday school. The posture that the disciples had, and especially Peter, because he was a leader of the, of the disciples. So he's looking back now and he's talking about how wrong he was. And he says, as obedient children, because he's saying, you know what? I wasn't obedient. The Lord told us to do things and the Lord showed us things. And you know what? I just thought it was foolishness. And I didn't obey. When he told us to go out and do these things, it was foolishness, we thought. We thought, what good is this going to do? When he's going to go put the army together. And many of us, we disobeyed as little children. And on the day of Pentecost, when they were all were baptized and filled with the Holy Spirit, all these revelations began to become real to them. And now Peter's looking back. And you know what? The Lord says, it's not sacrifice I want from you. I want obedience. I want obedience. When I say lay it down, I mean lay it down. When I say stand it up, I mean stand it up. If I say forgive, I mean forgive. If I say move from here to over to there, that means you move from here to over to there. Peter now is saying to the church, to the congregation, as obedient children, we must be obedient children. And you know what, folks? The scripture talks about, we have this movement today. We've always had movements in our country. But today, there's an assault on authority. And folks, there's an assault on this authority. And the scripture tells us to obey authority. That's why we want to vote in righteous people to rule over us. For when the righteous rule, the people rejoice. When the unrighteous rule, the people mourn. We're to obey authority. And of course, unless that authority tells us to, to break the law or to, to break God's commandments and so forth, then obviously we're not bound by that. But when we go to work, we obey our supervisors. We obey our bosses. Can you say amen? When you come to church, I expect you to do what the pastor asks. You know, when you pray and ask God for something, God says, okay, but I, I want you to be obedient first. Well, okay, Lord, I'll do the best I can. Wait a minute, before you obey me, you need to go back to church and obey what the pastor said and move from seat three to 14. <laughs> right, Jason? So you need this a lot. <laughs> God kept me up all night saying, preach this right at Jason. As obedient children. Now, listen to this. Now, put yourself in Peter's place back when he was a disciple for three and a half years. Not fashioning yourself according to the former loss. Peter here is not talking about sexual immorality. He's talking about self-loss. He's talking about them as the 12 disciples. They lost it for power. Boy, when the Messiah came and he started healing people and doing miracles, they knew, they knew. And when they were chosen from the 12 tribes of Israel, that they were the ones that were chosen. They were going to be the generals. And then they argued one with another. Wow, who do you think is going to be the greatest? You know, and then they argued and they, they snuck off away from Peter because everybody knows Peter was going to be the greatest, right? And so James and John snuck away from Peter and they devised this plan by themselves. And then at one point in time, they approached Christ. They approached the Lord and they said, Lord, we've got a question for you. The Lord said, whatever you want. They said, yeah, when, when we all finally get to heaven and paradise, can, can James sit on your right hand and I, John, can I sit on your left? We really, we really, because we've really invested all into this thing. Boy, did that make Peter mad. 
Peter saw those guys later on and said, Over my dead body, you think you're going to sit in the right hand and the left hand? There's no way. You see, folks, he lusted for power. That's what Peter's saying here. You see, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lusts. To the former lust. Now let me tell you, let me put a definition to that lust. And we all have it, and here it is. It's called this. Self-righteous gratification. Self-righteous gratification is the lust that Peter here is talking about. They couldn't wait to go to war and win the battle and rule. Somebody was going to be in charge. And it was one of those 12 that was going to be in charge. And they all lusted for that power. And how self-gratifying was it going to be? Folks, let me just tell you now. Let me just kind of be transparent to a certain extent. In the past however many years, the thing that the Lord has worked on me the most to conquer in my own personal life is the need for self-gratification. For self-gratification. Folks, 10, 15, 20, 30, 40 years ago, when you're young, strong, and stupid, it's all about self-gratification. And I don't believe anybody does anything that they don't get a little bit of self-gratification. But what Peter's talking about here, the lust for it, Oh, I know this is just going to make me. This is just going to be the greatest. This is going to be so awesome. And then we perceive sometimes God's will in the lust of our self-gratification. That has to be God's will. And before you know it, a young couple has called. They think they're called into the ministry. They become youth pastors. They become something. And before long, they're involved in church politics. Before long, church politics gets a hold of them. And before long, church politics, and there's politics in the church. There's politics in religion. It's huge. And before long, those church politics gets a hold of them. And they get discouraged. And they get frustrated. And folks, for as many people, for as many people that are in the ministry, the thousands, however that might be, there are ten times that many that have left the ministry because their need for self-gratification wasn't in the will of God. Many of them burn out. Many of them leave the church. Many of them turn their backs on God. They don't have the state power. Maybe they don't have the counseling. Maybe they don't have the support of the board or the support of the pastor. Maybe they just don't want to listen. Maybe they just don't want to hear it. Maybe they want it their way or the highway. Maybe what they, they bring isn't really from the Lord, folks. Have... Tell you what, being in the ministry isn't for weaklings. Being in the ministry isn't for pansies. And being in the ministry isn't for people who have pie in the sky that think that God has called them to save the world and how popular and how big and wealthy and rich are they going to be. You see what Peter's talking about here. He's telling us not fashioning yourselves according to the former lust, that former lust that he had. And now he's telling the church if there's that need for self-gratification, if we just come to church because it makes it feel good about ourselves. If we just come to church because when I leave church I feel a little bit better about myself than when I came. Then we're coming to church for the wrong reason. Sometimes we need to leave church feeling ashamed. Sometimes we need to leave church weeping. Sometimes we need to stop the laughter and get to the crying. And sometimes you need to stop crying and start laughing. It's a time and a season for everything. But why do we come to church? I couldn't wait to get to church this morning. 
These songs that we sang this morning, they're, my, they're really honestly my most favorite songs. They're so anointed. I hope that you were blessed by them because, folks, I'm telling you, <clears throat> as a musician, as a minister, as a Christian my whole life, raising the church my whole life, I'm telling you, those verses we sang this morning are anointed from the throne of God. And God is in the music. God is in the music. But I'm here to tell you, not all Christian music. God's not in all Christian music. God is in the music. Not fashioning yourselves according to the former lust. That need for self-righteous gratification. And then lastly he says, and this is such a revelation of himself, in your ignorance. See, he's talking about himself. He said, I was so ignorant. Listen, folks, he's saying to himself, I didn't know how good I had it. I lusted for self-gratification so much that I couldn't even see, know, understand, and recognize that it was God Almighty Himself to whom we listened to, to whom we saw, to whom we touched, to whom we broke bread with, to whom we lived with, God Himself. I was so consumed with other issues of life, other lusts of life, that I couldn't even recognize in my imputed ignorance that God Almighty was right here amongst us. And what He meant by what he said, and by what he meant, by what he did. He hung on the cross, and in total lustful need for self-gratification, I cursed and denied the very one that I loved. Please, please, please. Pastor, will you preach to your congregations to not fall prey to lustful self-gratification that promotes itself through self-ignorance and that we cause ourselves misery that we need not cause. But to seek God, seek Him for Himself, and only through Him will we know true gratification. You see, folks, and then as I get ready to wrap this up, Peter here is looking back. And he's thinking after Christ rose from the dead. And the Lord appeared unto them many times for 40 days. And he did a few more miracles and talked to them and expounded upon the things of God. And then he met with them before he ascended unto the throne and he said, now I want you to go wait. Go wait in the upper room. Go hang out and wait for a while. And just prior to those instructions, the last time that Peter saw the Lord. He hadn't seen the Lord for several days. And they all got discouraged. And they all grumbled and complained amongst themselves, not knowing how good they had it. This isn't good enough. That's not right. This is wrong. It should be like that. I don't think that's sufficient. That doesn't meet the need. And the 12 disciples, and they're talking amongst themselves, and they're Complaining and they're groveling and they're saying, you know what, we sold out everything to this guy. And Peter, we even followed you. Now what are we going to do? And Peter got so discouraged. He got so discouraged. He said, you know what, I'm going to leave the church. I'm going to leave the ministry. And I'm going to go back to what I used to do. I'm going fishing. You know what, we're going with it. You can have this stuff. You know what? I wasn't sure about it in the first place. 
And now it just shows, you know what? He hasn't appeared. He's forsaken us. Whatever. Let's go fishing. And we know the story. The Lord had one more mighty miracle to get Peter's attention before he told Peter to go wait in the upper room. Because you see, it was approximately 10 days that they had to go wait in the upper room before the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. And it was that last mighty miracle of the Lord on the seashore of fishes that gave Peter, James, and John, and all the disciples enough faith and hope that they now could go wait for 10 days, believing that what he said was true. Can you say amen? Don't. Please don't. Don't be captured by the need for self-gratification in your ignorance of what Christ truly wants to be in you. Oh, folks, when you look at the scripture, when you read Peter's writings in this fashion and form, and let's read the next two verses and then we'll be done. And then he said, but as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. You see, he's looking back and going, you know what, we used to swear at this guy. And he's not talking about swearing. He's talking about complaining and grumbling. And not being satisfied. And being lustful. Horrible things they would say. Horrible things they would talk about. Miss the whole point. Be ye holy in all manner of conversation. You know what, if there's any listening to this and you're talking in ways you need to stop talking, then you need to stop talking like that. And if there are some things that you need to be saying that are right, then you need to get to going to saying things that are need to be right. Can you say amen? amen. You see, this is, I'm not beating this with a whip, right? I mean, this is just, this, this, is, this is the word of God. See? And we're all there at one point in time in our lives. So be ye holy in all manner of conversation. And then 16, and we close with this. Because it is written, be ye holy, for I am holy. And you can't be holy when we lust for self-gratification. Self-righteous gratification. Well, I'm right. I'm right. And because I'm right, that's just the way it's going to be. You know, it's unbelievable that some people, for the energy, for just knowing that they're right, they're willing to destroy relationships. They're ready. They're willing to lose all kinds of money. They're, they're willing to destroy all kinds of things just to be right. God forbid. Can you say amen? Let's all stand.